All right, outstanding. Melissa, I see you. Are you driving? Where's Miss Brandy? Yes, I'm I'm driving. Where's Miss Brandy? Brandy? She's probably home by now. Well, she needs to quit fucking around. <laughs> she had to get home and have dinner with her family. I get it. Sorry, was, it pretty, I was... was it pretty awesome at the Hoff, Melissa? It's always awesome there. We had a good time. It was all right. Yeah, we had a good time. It was interesting. Spent too much money going down there, but that's all right. <laughs> so, based on this weekend's interaction with individuals, what kind of question have you got, Melissa? Hold on a second. I had to turn down this thing so I can hear better. All right, say it again. So, after this weekend's interaction, what kind of questions would you have on this? I don't know, man. I'm still taking some stuff in. Like what? Well, you know, when we're up there, there's always different personalities. So you're, the way you interact is totally different, you know? Really? Yeah. <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm still trying to drive. My car is apparently, the defrost has apparently decided that it, it only works part time, and so it's driving me a little insane. So my focus is not perfect, and I apologize. <laughs> I get it, man. Well, Mike, what kind of what kind of uh, what kind of idea would you like to discuss tonight? What I would like to discuss is in uh, if you look at uh, our people, yes, and uh, like when Rome was attacking Germania, and mm -hmm. this is relevant to modern time. I'm not going abstract on you. Just give me a second here. I like to paint the picture. <laughs> Go ahead. So uh, you see that there was a, a lot of tribes and uh, we did end up uh, pushing back and being quite victorious, uh, many battles, but you see it again today, right? When we don't have the benefit of being born into these uh, structured tribes, we're relearning who we are almost like we're coming home, such as, the, you know, also true in a general people are waking, reawakening to who they are and who they should have been raised as but we still hold on to those ancestral attributes and we bump heads so much over miscellaneous things but we all are fighting for the same thing and i just want to see everyone united and fighting forward and i kind of uh i find myself almost second guessing myself sometimes because i come at it from different angles and you never want to be the detractor or the person to distract from unity and uh Sometimes I catch myself second guessing if a, a decision or a, is beneficial to the overall versus one's own personal needs. I'm not sure if I'm conveying my question in too many parts or if it's coming across clear. I think I know what you mean. You know, I, I see that myself. I see that a lot. And I, I've been accused of promoting myself over the good of the people. I've heard that, I've heard that a couple of times. Uh, usually by men that can't do what I can do. What, um, the thing that troubles me, and we started all this with an idea. You know, we started all this with an idea with our, our ancestral faith. And we have so few people that have the strength of character to say that, that, that it has to be black or white. It has to be black or white. Look, I get along with all kinds of people. Now, that does not mean I'm, I'm going to invite them to eat at my dinner table, nor does it mean I want them fucking my daughter. Now, the inability to say Hey, we're going to get along just fine. But this is the rules. I don't need to sacrifice anything about who I am to allow you to exist in my world. Um, that takes courage of, and strength of character. And we have, we have a certain weakness bred into us uh, and reinforced with Christianity. It's a great scar of Christianity. 
Oh, come all ye faithful and sit at the feet of the Lord. And he is an all-inclusive, broad, and roomy and welcome spiritual realm that everyone may attend. Well, why can't I go in there? Well, you can, but that doesn't mean I'm going to do it with you. You can, play, you can do whatever you want. I don't care. When we haven't produced a body of spiritual work, really the only thing that's been people have been able to fall back on for several for a while now two things the righteous indignation of separateness and book learning so if i know more than you well that of a necessity to the ego driven mind means that i might be a little bit more spiritually advanced than you which could be quite the opposite in practice. Uh, that person that knows a whole bunch may be a true cocksucker at work without any kind of spiritual relaxation or the ability to say, you know, it's going to be all right. <clears throat> the righteous indignation centers around you motherfuckers can't, you're black, you can't worship the way I worship. You're a Jew. You can't worship the way I worship. Y'all are trying to tear up my world. Um, and there's so much going on with that, that if I wanted to switch gears and change everything I've talked about and promoted and advanced, I could become very popular by espousing those two ideas. Quickly, quickly. But I've always said from the beginning, nothing positive can be built out of hate. So where's that lead us? So we don't have solid spiritual foundation that gives us the strength of character to say, I really like you, bud. You're a good man. No, you can't eat at my table because this is my family. This is how I'm going to keep it. We don't have a solid spiritual background. We can't do it unless we're angry. And that's never a good place to bring forth a no. A good, healthy, um, quality no comes from a place of understanding who we are. Not one of righteous indignation, anger, or hate, or victimhood. Because they all three travel together. Um, now, if you look at the Catholic Church, look at the Catholic Church. There's a billion practicing Catholics in the world out of 7 billion people. Are we to believe that they all get along? Are we to believe that the man, the 78-year-old man that's sitting there that fought in Vietnam that remembers the, the 60s and, the, and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and the march in, in Selma, Alabama and and the assassination of Martin Luther King, or perhaps his father's still alive and he's in his 90s and he remembers the 1950s and segregation. Uh, are we to believe that those men have set aside how they were raised to be good Christians in a Catholic church and welcome with open arms the, the homosexual couple with a, with a black man and, and two black men or this couple over here that does this, are we to believe that they've <laughs> really set that down and uh, have become an all-inclusive and welcoming idea? No, they probably haven't. They'll sit on the other side of the church. They'll let them people do what they want to fucking do. And the pastor will collect the donation plate from both of them. So we've got ourselves in a real pickle. We started off with the easy, quick, low-hanging fruit we could pick. I can pick the low-hanging fruit of anger, righteous indignation, victimhood, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. I can preach fire and brimstone. I can preach fire and brimstone concerning space Jews, and they're coming back to rule the world they believe is theirs, and the fact that all these black people, you know, we ought to repeal that Civil Rights Act, and they really have something to be angry about. Yeah. Do I pick, is that low hanging fruit worth it? Because we've picked it for 50 fucking years. 
and look where it's got us. We are no longer capable of collecting from the collection plate of all of these people that wish to worship Oma, people that are descended from the same people that we are. So should we sacrifice our folkish ideas? No. Not one tittle, not one jot. But I firmly believe we should strenuously endeavor to produce a body of spiritual literature, principles, guidelines, and thought processes that allow us to maintain our integrity and who we are in the same manner they're capable of doing. Look at the Oriental people, Japanese, Thai people, Vietnamese people. Shinto religion has something along the lines of 10,000 deities. It's, it's an enormous number of deities. 10,000? Holy at, at least, according to Joseph Campbell. <laughs> they have maintained their cultural integrity with pride and dignity. Why are we having such a hard time doing that? Without being mad about it. Because we no longer have a spiritual foundation to stand on. Until we have a solid and firm understanding of our spiritual foundation, we're always going to be, we're always going to be subject to the same kind of temptations that pull us down rabbit holes we can't do a fucking thing about. But if we lead successful lives where we don't feel like trash, <laughs> where we're not wrapped up in well, you don't understand David Lane quite as well as I do. You're kind of a piece of shit. Um, go fuck yourself. Now, that kind of ego boosting mindset is always going to cripple our ability. It's going to chip away at the edges of, what, of the rock we're trying to build. And I know that's fucking, I stole that directly from Christianity, but it's there for a reason. The ermine soul that holds up the pillars of heaven, the pillar of heaven itself. <laughs> we're struggling to erect that again because we're focused on dumb shit. We have folk builders out there right now that I know of that I would not listen to. If I were to meet them on the street, I would look at that motherfucker and laugh at him. Several of them. Because what are they trying to do? They don't have a solid spiritual foundation from which to operate. But they do have the encouragement and support of a bunch of people that will allow them to pick the low-hanging fruit first. Okay? I get that. Get them in the door. Make sure they have some kind of character. Make sure they have some kind of backbone. Make sure they have a willingness to stand up and fight for what they believe in. That's the raw material we want to work with. How do we temper that? We collected copper from the Great Lakes and mixed it with tin from Cornwall to create the Bronze Age in Northern Europe, as opposed to the copper and, and tin from uh, Afghanistan and the Silk Road for Southern Europe. Um, we got to take that raw material and we got to make it into something that's got to be forged into a solid spiritual belief system. <clears throat> we have such a tumultuous environment in which to do that. We've seen success in it at one time, haven't we? Prior to World War II, we saw just the hint of the Suilo rune success and what it was capable of creating. Now, be that heady and toxic that it is, um, success is a, will ruin a man. It's quite possible it did that to him. But we see the success. So we're tempted to, okay, maybe that's how I get some success. Well, none of us are speaking German now. So is that really the recipe for success? 
is the understanding of that political system, the recipe for the success or the answer for the ills our society is dealing with. Man created government as a substitute for God. Man created government for people to believe passionately in as a substitute for God. If, any, if Adolf Hitler was anything, he was a statist. If it didn't, have, if it didn't benefit the fatherland, um, he didn't want nothing to fucking do with it, period. <laughs> he, wrote, he wrote clearly about it, Mein Kampf. So this is kind of where we are. We're given this, all of this raw material around us. How do we best present that? Okay. What's the one thing none of us want to deal with? Pain. Many of us, I know I personally do, carry a body of pain somewhere right about here. And if I were to focus on it for any given moment, much of that pain would, would reignite and I would start thinking about it and feeling like trash. Fucked up things I've done, the shit I've done to people, the things that have been done to me broken hearts, all that good stuff, failures, <clears throat> the pain of our children. So at what point do we begin to address a healing remedy of that? Because we quite frankly have a body of literature and we have legends and tales and stories and examples from all of these divine beings that provided positive purpose, guidance and direction for millions of people for 10,000 years or more. Why can't we find that now? Why are we struggling so hard to do that? Well, because it would require us to take this body of pain and examine it, apply certain principles to it, the nine noble virtues are a good set to use and rid ourselves of it. Okay, what happens to Brian if I don't have that pain anymore? So if I find myself on a brand new grand horizon of spiritual adventure, it's just amazing. And I feel like carrying my ego with me into that broad and roomy environment if we are not quickly learning that it is the most expensive and heaviest piece of luggage that we are in possession of, we're missing the boat. Where do we learn that? How do we help somebody set that down, free themselves from it? How do we help someone set the, set the pain down of, of loss of anyone in the family, of any person, of a job, of, of self-worth, of being suicidal? I can't sit there and talk to them when they're in that kind of pain, when they're in their cups. Well, them fucking Jews. We have to be so much more than that. We have to be so far beyond what anyone expects of us that they can't hold a candle to the things we say. Dave Martell is a, is a prime example of that. That I mean, he has skilled himself at making a radical comment that can be misconstrued in several different ways and then crawfishing away from it and then coming back with, oh, yeah, you're absolutely right, and still maintaining his poise and his ego. And I had a, a priestess of, the Hellen, of, of a Hellenistic branch of paganism Send me a message the other day. She's like, you know, if I didn't know you, Brian, I would have a much different perception of much of what Austria calls itself today. Hmm. Why? Why would this priestess of the Hellenic faith have a much different understanding of Austria if she didn't know me? Think about that. So when we're striving to build and ourselves into someone that doesn't second guess our decisions and we grab a hold of this faith and the things that are in it, um, 
are we creating an individual? Are we reinforcing the raw material that God's gifted us with, with absolute solid steel of character that allows us to be someone worth knowing? Do you think James Alt is someone worth knowing? Do you think, whatever, maybe that's not his name. Do you think some of these other cult builders, do you see them on a path that makes them someone worth knowing? Because that's a real question we have to ask ourselves. Is this Gothi going to provide me the kind of spiritual advice that I value? See, because as a Gothi, we're going to be faced very much with life and death situations with other people. We've got to have the right words to say. So when we're crafting that foundation or reinforcing that rigid framework of spirituality within ourselves, this raw material and these gifts that gods have absolutely blessed us with in abundance, are we creating that individual worth knowing that is not knowing because he can be great, but knowing because he understands it's a benefit to those people that he would love. That's kind of where I'm at with it. Now, it doesn't mean I won't fuck around with three or four of them at a time, but still. <laughs> but this is what I'm, this is, this is what we have to do, Mike. This is very much, and Melissa knows, Melissa's heard me say this before. These are very much the things we got to deal with. <clears throat> At least I may not have answered your question, Mike, but I think I think there's within that monologue, there's 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 some good things to think about to really because I feel from you when I deal with you, I feel from you a desire to set certain things aside and really be someone. And I don't know what all your past is. I know there've been some, some very hard times in your life. Um, and now all of this opportunity is laid at your feet. There's a legitimate desire to be more. But what happens if we let all that stuff we've made us go? We've both been fighters in the fucking street, Mike. And there's a transition that happens, much like the transition from Tyr to Thor or Tyr to Odin, where we become that person that is a benefit for people to know. Do we bring a smile to their face? You can do that in spades, buddy. Um, maybe I'll call Mike. I don't feel shit's not going right. I'm not sure what to do. I'm going to call Mike. I don't know what to do. That warm, personable approach will take you further in this world than you can possibly imagine. I like to make fun of having a short penis. I mean, that always works. <laughs> it catches them off guard. <laughs> what do you say? They can't, uh, I can't hit the bottom of a tuna can, but I can throw yeah. one up. It's not that long and not that big around either, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I have teenagers in my car. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry. You have Rex and Zoe in a car, don't you? No, I do. Well done, guys. Well done. <laughs> well, I at least I sucked them in and got them thinking about it. So now they know. And now that they understand that grown men really are a joke. Good group. <laughs> Rex, I'm sorry, buddy. The future is not that bright. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's definitely, definitely a lot to chew on, for sure. It is a lot to chew on. It's a lot to chew on a lot. But when you when you have that framework in mind, it, it, it changes everything. I, I don't know how to... So if you read my work, and then you read Mark's work, or you read somebody else's work, you, you, you come out with, with, oh, son of a bitch. You come out with, uh, you see where they're shooting. You see who's taking the shot to get the leg up on the guy next to him. 
are they shooting at those things that uh, I tried to read and it's really not worth reading, but I, I read, what is it? O Odo? <laughs> Some bullshit. Um, almost all of the literature you buy today, one of the difficult things about buying a book in Austria, for me anyway, it's the same stories. Same fucking stories. And there might be a smattering of opinion in there concerning, I hate the AFA. I hate, I, I hate that other people hate that kind of nonsense or there'll be the kind of thing as be a proud Aryan man. What the fuck does that even look like? In today's day and age, when we have no proving ground, we have no ground that is set us, okay, you go through the army, you go to prison, you make it through, you do your time. In both places, you do your time. You come out the other side, you're a man. You're a man. You're a man. Drink beer, dally with the girls, all these good things. You're a man. Woman, she has a baby. You're a woman. Well, now what? We, we really... We haven't got a designated area that says, this is the point, I'm gonna tie you to a tree and let you stay out here all night while the wolves circle you to see if you can conquer the fears of a little boy and become a man and, separate, and stand instead of sitting there hollering for mama, you can sit there and growl back. But, I mean, literally some of those man-making ceremonies at the time of that time, I've read some of them, were that group for, in the central part of the world, it wasn't animalistic. It wasn't animals they had to contend with. It was nature herself. Because there was always something to eat. There was always food. They made, then they became human sacrifices. I read one tale of uh, the man-making ceremony and woman-making ceremony where these men I think it was Indonesia, would build this huge wooden structure and they put it on four posts. And for the boys to become men, there would be a very pretty girl underneath that structure. And the boys would run underneath there after they'd been, I don't know, brutalized for a couple of days and run under there and kiss this girl. Or I don't know. But the last dude that got picked, the four men went up there and busted the post out and sacrificed the boy and the girl so that that spirit, that energy would go back and recognize this great man making ceremony that just occurred. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think we should do that anymore, but we need to look at why they were doing it. Why in the hell would they kill their kid? And see, that's one of the things that made it easy for Christianity to conquer much of the world. So think about the Aztec temples and they're sacrificing 1500 children a day and, and conquered war, warriors and people and the prettiest girl in the village and virgins and boys. And, you know, they're just sitting there just killing the shit out of people waiting on these gods, Quetzalcoatl to come in and bring the rain. But when a missionary shows up and says, oh, no, 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 you don't have to do that anymore. Our God died for you, so you never have to do that again. <laughs> Sign me up, motherfucker. I like my kids. You know, that's kind of how that went. But we gave up something real important there. I don't know what it is, really, but we gave up a solid framework of uh, the, the, the phrase always goes, there's two great gifts that are left unopened in life are love and death. And we have such a terrible connotation of death these days that we, people are terrified of it. You know, I'm sure you've been in a couple of tight spots, Mike. I've been in a couple of tight spots. I'm sure you have too, Melissa. Just scared, man. This might be it. This might be it. <clears throat> But Aldous Huxley ate uh, mushrooms on his deathbed. As he died, he was tripping balls. Think about that transition. Um, if you listen to some of the uh, 
some of the other people that talk about being in the now, being right here, right now, and they talk about death. Um, when you're in the now, that fear of death kind of changes. You kind of, I got to work on that because I've been thinking about that for a minute. <laughs> But that's another one of those things that we don't have a solid handle on with regards to our faith. How do we help people negotiate this great gift of death when it's your mama? When it hurts more than you can imagine. How do we help people negotiate that in this faith? I'm not sure I've figured out how to negotiate that one particularly myself, so. <laughs> Hey, I'm telling you, man, my dad died. I'm still going. I'm going to therapy for it now. Trying to figure out some things. <clears throat> Although I dream about them all the time. I see them in what I perceive to be this image of the halls of my ancestors. I have dreams, vivid dreams and interactions with them. And it lessens the pain. And, it, and it's a fond remembrance. And it's, a, it's usually a wonderful time. These are in my dreams now. So the physical interaction that I'm so familiar with has now moved on to this world of this realm of dreams that once a week, at least, I have a dream of my grandfathers or my grandmothers or some kind of interaction. Sometimes my dad's there. So why does it cause us so much pain? How come we can't help our people negotiate that? How come we can't help our people raise their eyes instead of keeping their heads lowered when they're dealing with the loss of pain, the pain of loss. Um, sometimes it's the wounds they create. It stymies the effort. I know with my father it did. But is that dream no less real than my interaction with you right now? I can't reach out and touch you. I can't smell you. I have no idea what your breath smells like. Can't shake your hand. Hmm. <laughs> Why should I not consider that dream to be every bit as real as this digital communication? Because I don't understand it. I don't think that's a good enough reason. I don't think that's a good enough reason to, 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 to just deny it. How do I share that idea of reality to someone that's right in the middle of their cups? Mm, maybe we should look at that. How many times are dreams discussed in the lore? There is a, there are quite a few times it was discussed. I don't worry so much about the dying part. The thing I think that's the worst thing about death to deal with is the after you know, thoughts. Like sometimes you lose people that mean a lot to you, but you always second guess whether or not, you know, treated them the way you should have or if you apologized you should have <laughs> but it's the that part's the part that bothers me but the part about the dying i've never worried so much about it i've always figured that by the time it was time to go it wasn't going to matter i was going either way so yeah our uh, our our understanding of comprehension of it is kind of interesting let's see here i think i have a deal on dreams while well, this kind of got my imagination and this huge collection of nonsense much of it old Owl and Celtic symbology and mythology, that was always, that was interesting. Yes, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> I 
That's Scarlet's ultrasound. See her little friend right there? Nice. There's a face in that ultrasound. Yeah, right, I can see it. Right there. I thought that was cool. Well, I can't find it. I had one on dreams and dreams in uh, Teutonic mythology. Because there's a bunch of them. There's a bunch. Dreams are very important. But there was a time when, oh, dreams are dumb. That's just um, UPG. I did see that term come up there. Unverified personal gnosis. You think for uh, next week's show, you could start out with the dream one, maybe pull it up or figure it out? If I can find it, yeah. Okay. I can find I it. Cool. Talk about dreams. It's a real hazy article. It was sent to me by an elder heathen that I met. He, when I first came in, he'd been hanging around for 20 years. And um, his name is Danny. And um, just cool as shit. Just cool as shit, old guy. And he's like many others. Um, decided to be a, a solitary practitioner. I kind of get that a little bit. I mean, when I first started, I was more that way. I preferred it almost, but it was because of the people that I was dealing with. I would go to a blow and they'd be like, fuck yeah, old dude. And it was like, they, they might <laughs> believe, but it didn't feel like they believed. And then uh, when I kind of experienced the, AF, the AFA, uh, there's like whole families. And so it's not just that warrior aspect and it's really what latched me onto it. That and it's not role play. But uh, I don't know, I feel like I've grown more with the community than I have leaps and bounds even than I had in my own personal practice. I still do personal though. Like uh, sometimes one of my mo most powerful things are at my home uh, with my own self. And uh, but at, at the same time, I think as you let yourself go more, right? I think that's what it is. You can be like totally open with the gods and be you. Um, because we all have that ego, I guess, in public. And, yeah, there's uh, always, what are, what are they going to think? <laughs> yeah, I think it's true, right? People can say whatever they want, but it's very few that can put that aside. I think that's what separates it. That's like my constant battle, though, because I don't have a, I feel like I don't have a huge ego, but then the other part of me is like, you got a huge ego. <laughs> so it's like, oh, mine's, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's being able to identify as the real trick. Yeah. I try to be pretty humble, but. I think I uh, fell on that sometimes. My ex-wife would tell you definitely. Oh gosh, man! I got girlfriends now that will tell you your ego is way too big, man. What? <laughs> there is a difference between ego being out of control and ego being healthy. When an ego is out of control, it doesn't matter what's really going on. That's a false bravado. But when your ego is healthy, that's knowing that. You have something to offer and being confident in the fact that you are um, going and making those right steps and those right moves for what you feel is the right reason. It comes from a genuine place. Absolutely. That ego is never good. I don't know why people keep talking about that as if it's good. But it drives me insane. I think it is when it's healthy. But I, it could also be called a think about it as a different word yeah, yeah that's what I think. confidence so here I'll, I'll show you let me let me present to you some of the greatest scientific minds of this day and their thoughts on ego how about that so here's an idea some of these ideas people are good So if you look these, what trickster do we have, Loki?
Very hard thing to configure out. That is fucking important. You will have to paraphrase for me because I cannot read that. Say what? I said, you will have to paraphrase for me what that's all about because I can't read it. Can't read it? No, I'm driving. Yeah, I will have to. Uh... So that's a real hard thing to think about. If we begin to think of our of different entities operating within our mind, this was the foundation of Eber's Feast. We begin to think about different thought processes, reactions, emotions, ideas happening in our mind. It lends itself to the idea, who am I? So once we begin to think in terms of that I am the thought behind this collection of thoughts, I am the essence behind this collection of thoughts, we can begin to take a look at this idea of the ego and the pain body and the victim mindset and all of these other things, because each one of them will raise its ugly head in any given situation to create a response that we have been conditioned to employ uh, to handle whatever stressor might be affecting our life. The body doesn't know what the mind is thinking isn't really happening. And that breaks it down further. If you meditate, try to reach out and feel your hand sometime. It's an amazing experience. It is such a different wild conglomeration of flows of energy that our ability to handle that is typically given an autopilot. And that autopilot usually says, God will take this for me, or the devil made me do it. I never have to take responsibility for it. We can perceive it in that manner. But if we were to say, okay, I'm going to step back. I am the awareness behind the collection of thoughts. But there are other things 
that would much rather me act in a different way. My ego being one of them. Um, I'll create an enemy. Okay. Let's say the Jews. The Jews are fucking us over. They're ruining society. We're doing all this other stuff. Okay. So we've created an enemy. Now we have someone to hate. We owe them a great deal of gratitude. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking to each other. So all the people at this table, oh, all the people at that table, I thank you for bringing all these people together. And we're all operating on the same thought frequency. We're all operating on this, that, and the other. We begin to take the idea that I don't really give a fuck what those people are doing at all. Hmm. Now I'm not really welcome at that table anymore, am I? Okay. Now what? Do I become a self-actualized individual? Do I begin to try and ascend into something more than I currently am? Am I willing to set aside some of these things? Am I willing to try to identify the ego? As soon as you do that, oh, no, I don't have an ego, um, but it should be healthy. How your ego talk? When Odin sacrifices himself to himself, what clear indication could we have in our Lord that he is ridding himself of the ego that brought about his own fucking downfall in the war with the, with the Vanir. He created an external enemy. And the only thing they asked was, should worship belong to one or should it belong to all of us gods? Hmm. <clears throat> when we look at all, when we look at the ego, the victim mindset, the pain body, the thought process that brings forth all that pain that we decide to indulge in because of whatever fucking song happens to be on the radio. When we think about being a victim because of all of the wrongs going on in the world and how they rightly affect me, like Joe Biden. When we think about all of the, the things that I am greater than because, when I create the sense of, all three of those create a sense of separation. They separate me from you. They separate me from a child. They separate me from the energy, except for the fact that I don't give a fuck how separate you feel. The energy that animates this body is no separate from the rest of the flow of energy across the surface of this world than a wave is from the ocean. All we're doing is causing ourselves unnecessary pain so we can feel more than separate from, better than something, something, because we don't live in a world that allows us to create who we want to be, or at least we think that. Nothing could be further from the truth. So when we craft all this idea in spiritual terms with regards to also truth, what are we offering? But if, if it's not hope that once we do reconnect with nature and find our soul, um, we're spinning our wheels. Spending our time creating and reinforcing ideas of separateness from the world in which we live does nothing but ensure that we will always be limping or missing a hand. How much clearer could it be? At least it's clear to me. At least that's how I see it. Um, Does it, you know, you, you, everybody wants to know what's the, how does that show up in your life, Brian? Well, fuck, I'll show you. So right now I live in a little bitty apartment. I live in a little bitty apartment. This is my bedroom. Fucking air mattress on the floor. <laughs> It'll be kitchen. I have a living room. Has one couch in it. Scarlet on the floor and a TV. Now, I'm Brian Wilton. Is that how I should be living? Melissa, you've been to my house, ain't you? Yes. Did it look like that? Absolutely not. <laughs> right. Exactly right. So I know what I'm worth. I know what I'm capable of. That less, that little of stuff 
doesn't cause me to feel that terrible, crippling fucking anxiety of, oh my gosh, I'm behind everyone else. Everybody else is doing better than me. What can I'm, I'm just, I suck at life. This is terrible. I'm not doing any good and I'm failing again. The first time in my life I can be in this situation and be comfortable with me. I don't know about the rest of you or anybody else that might hear this, but God damn, that's so much freedom for me. You can't imagine. For me. When we're talking about ego and all the different thought processes that we've been conditioned to employ in this society, and we are very much conditioned to employ them. And we look at Eager's Feast, where all of these various deities are seated at a table, feasting in the ocean, the, the, the bounty of the world itself, feasting in the medium that is the conduit of spiritual energy. When we have all of these various gods, the warder of men, the the goddess of love, a god of strength and beauty, a god of, of, of Odin, and we have, <laughs> he's a god of so many things, death and poetry and madness and inspiration, and a god, a god of song and a goddess of youth, tends the life, the fruits, the vigorousil, and one bad apple comes in there, one bad thought comes in that room, and fucks everything up. The same thing with us. One bad thought, one weak thought enters my mind. And in an hour, I can be sitting here on this kitchen floor feeling sorry for myself, sad. I'm not, I'm, I want to go home. Run on home, I tell to my legs to mama. <clears throat> not anymore. That's where my journey through Austria has led me to be okay with things. Next weekend, all this is going to change. But I have to put my ego and understand that's not me. That's not my thought process. That is not the energy that animates me. It's simply a conditioned thought process. Somebody said I fucking have Freud or somebody like that. That I should have because, well, hell yeah, you need to have it. That way you can be manipulated, conditioned, and focus on working for everybody else. And if you're not competing with everybody else, you feel like trash. What struck me the most about that conversation of I feel like trash is it was a fucking Halloween party. Everybody already had a mask on of their ego. When we set that aside, are we not offering something that represents freedom of man itself? Oh, fuck, man. Now all of a sudden, we got something big to work on. Paraphrase it is, is ego. Ego is the greatest trickster it's ever been in, that we've ever had to deal with. It will lie, cheat, steal to maintain what we call ego boundaries to protect. Well, I, I, I'm this. Who do we see that lies, cheats, and steals and murders all through the law? If it's not the uninspired, uninitiated human intellect we refer to as Loki, the human ego. That is one hell of a piece of apple to chew on right there. Right there. <laughs> You're going to have to. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> My brain is like trying to comprehend all this stuff, man. I'm telling you. I think. Uh, doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's true. It just means that's what's helped me get through right. some of the things I go through. And if it helped me, maybe it'll help you. And if there's some framework you can put on that, mm -hmm. say, okay. That's all that fucking counts. Yeah. That's it, man. That's it. I appreciate you, man. And uh, and I, I really, uh, I'm going to have to think about that for a couple of days. Like, honestly, to really, like, mow over all that. Get the, I think, book, uh, get, get the book Eager's Feast. Okay. I don't, I don't know. Melissa may have a copy. All right. I do. You can borrow it from me if you want. It's good. Is Eager's Feast on uh, Audible, too? 
I, Do I have Audible? I don't know. I don't know if it is. I have nine books on Audible, but I think they shadow banned me on that fuck. Really? Yeah, I get. Huh. Yeah, I got on a friend's Audible and I searched for myself. Couldn't find a single thing. No, I've seen you on there. Yeah. Yeah, it's on there. Let's see if I can. Do you want to copy that book? Yeah, I've sold 1,361 audible titles. What's it called? Eager's Feast. A-E-G-I-R. Yep, and that always, every time you bring up that book, it always reminds me of that. It's not, I don't have it. It's I not on audible. I think I, re, I sent it out for a narrator to do and they never did it. All right. So this is a, uh, we're doing this every week, right? Yes. We're going to be the same time, same time next week for sure. We'll just keep it at eight o'clock. And yep. uh, I, know, I know how to run these now too. I'm good. So, is that good with you, Melissa, right? Next week, same time? Oh yeah. It's already oh. set up. I had already set it in there for a reoccurring thing. Oh, I thought, I thought Tabby did it for me today. I was like so dumb. I, one of those things where I was so used to like other people doing it that I was like, let me see if I can figure it out. And it was like pretty simple. Yeah, yeah. Like that. yeah. It was set up, it'll automatically come in every week. It shouldn't have to change. The one that you guys do for Arkansas, it should always come up automatically. Yeah, it's on there too. You're awesome yeah. for that. Thank you. Yeah, and the one for this week for Sunday should also automatically come up. That way, nobody ever has to. If you have to put a code in, you guys, do we have to put codes in for you guys? I always come in through my own account, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't have to put any in. I just join. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. That's awesome. I uh, I got some roommates here. They're trying to do something for for Sauron. Is that uh, are we are we good with doing uh, catching the next one? Yes. I don't think I can digest anything else mentally. Like, cause you know how like uh, honestly, you get too much knowledge and it's like it, it's not good, right? Cause you have, right. If, if you're not processing stuff, and you like the, you got you got a plethora, man. Like if I could pick your brain. I mean, I'd be that's what we're doing okay. here, man. That's it. That's it. So, I mean, it's going to take a minute, though. It's not going to be one of them. Because you could listen to somebody all day, but if you're not processing it, I don't feel like it's even a point, right? You have to actually pay attention and then reanalyze it. So, so that's why that's why in the middle of the conversation, I tried to connect with you a little bit. Yeah, I like that. So that's so when you're dealing with a student, when you're dealing with somebody that needs your clergy skills, you can talk for a little while. Then make sure you. Make sure you connect with them again so that there's a, okay, so I am familiar with it. Okay, so what is he saying to you? So you maintain that connection and it, it's, a, it's, it's a called limbic resonance. And maybe we can talk about it. I think that has to do with what, when Odin sacrificed and I, he already knew everything. Mm -hmm. He already had all the rooms. What else was he looking for when he sacrificed and I? The fuck else could it be? Well, we are capable of understanding each other's emotional states without saying a word. That's called limbic resonance. Might be handy for a ruler or a god. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we can talk about that next week. All right, my man. I appreciate Drink. you very much. All right. Andrew. Hey, you drive safe, Melissa. Yeah, You're be careful. Important cargo. Oh, yes. We will. All right. I'll see you later. All right. We'll see you guys. Bye. Bye. Good night.